Mm. Yo, what's going on? Welcome to Black Man Talk Therapy. What's up, Remy? What's going on? What's going on, bro? Oh, we got like a, this is like one, probably a heavy episode because it took a lot of time for us to develop. It took a lot of research, um, took a lot of reading, took a lot of self-reflection uh, just for us to come up with this uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, what you think after going through this? Uh, going through it, man, this was definitely heavy. I can't even take credit for this because it's something that yeah, you, you put time and you put okay. time and effort into this and I got to give it to you. You got to give credit where it's due. Like after seeing this PowerPoint, I'm like, this is something that definitely needs to be shared with the people, especially the people that we're trying to reach in creating this podcast. So uh, I believe the the idea, the concept behind this was basically to provide facts because a lot of episodes that we've done so far has been like personal encounters and personal experiences. Not to it's say... Right, it's right. Not to... Right, right. Not to say to take anything from that because it still happened and it's true. But um, to, I guess, step away from uh, perspectives that people would say is bias and, um, you know, step into the realm of academia and um, facts. So I think what you did with this presentation is definitely speaking volumes on that. And, and the reason why you want to you want to dive into the realm of academia is because, again, they spent years and years and years of studying this. Um, probably went through uh, tons of observations, which science science is basically observation. So they've been going through a bunch of observations, mm -hmm. um, witnessing patients and stuff like that. That's why um, I felt like it's very important for us to bring the professionals in instead of just listening to us. Because anybody could be like, oh, well, we're making stuff up or we didn't really go through all this stuff. But you got multiple people in academia who study these things, um, yeah. you know, who, you know, who put their work and effort into it. And that mm. definitely outweighs people who never studied it or never put any boots on the ground um, in that in that realm. Well, without further ado, we're going to start it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. so, so, um, so mental health awareness is the recognition that our psychological well-being is an important part of our health, productivity and happiness, as well as the well-being of our community. Because again, that's what we're doing it. We're doing it for our community. First, we want to say that we are not professionals. We are educators. We are not experts. This project was made because we have been personally impacted. Remy uh, with his brother and his own well-being and me with people from my community and my own well-being uh, have been personally impacted with mental health, either with ourselves or individuals in our community. We want to first raise awareness for individuals in our community to see a psychiatrist, to get evaluated, and then to seek remedy for our condition. If you're not comfortable or can't get evalu an evaluation, then discovering coping mechanisms is important. Um, there are mental health issues where you can't heal, you can only cope with. And um, that's something that I had to learn through um, with doing this research. So There's a bunch of things that we go through that we can't heal from, we can only cope with it. Um, mm -hmm. with doing, by doing certain activities. Um, there's a strong possibility that you may have the underlying conditions and all you need is one trigger to spark a mental breakdown. If those break, when those breakdowns happen, you might not even notice it. Um, mental health awareness provides a timely reminder that mental health is essential and that those living with mental health issues are describing, of deserving of care, understanding, compassion and pathways to hope, healing, recovery, and fulfillment. We can't speak for nobody else. We could only speak for what um, black people go through in the inner cities and Hispanic people go through in the inner cities and anybody that live in the inner cities. Um, in that case, that's been there for a sustainable, sustainable amount of time. Uh, we can't mm. speak for nobody else. You know what I mean? Um, I can't speak for um, Asian community. I can't speak for white communities. I can't speak for upper class. Um, African American communities who've been that that hasn't come from our area and evolved into the area that they're in right now, um, we can't speak for those individuals. We can only speak for individuals that's been in our community for a sustained amount of time, and then either elevated themselves mm -hmm. from that position or they went uh, probably a negative path because there's people yeah. in our community that 
went positive routes and there's people that go in my community that come from negative routes. But there's also people that look like us that don't share the same social economic status as us. Um, and we definitely want to make sure that we highlight that just because um, this is not specifically just for, I know I put it in the PowerPoint for black and Hispanics. This is for everybody that's lived and dealt with the trauma that our community has dealt with hmm. too. Um, next slide. Go ahead, Remy. So we're doing, uh, in order to bring out these um, powerful concepts, we're going to be using different elements such as quantitative and qualitative sources. Mm -hmm. um, and for those of you who don't know what it, what it is, uh, quantitative methods empathize objective measurements and the statistical. Um, qualitative research relies on data obtained by the researcher from firsthand observation, interviews, questionnaires, on which participants write descriptively focus groups, participant observance, uh, observations, recordings, made in natural settings, documents, and artifacts. So one of the things that we're going to bring it out is just uh, we want to show people facts. It's not just personal encounters and um, things that we have gone through personally, but what the research says, what the experts say. Because I'm pretty sure doing this, a lot of people have said, you know, why are we doing things the way that we're doing it? And why are we just focusing on our communities? And because when you look at the statistics, it shows that our communities are the ones that really need this the most. And we're going to bring those, that information out to support why it is that we're using it, you know? Um, so we're also going to use rap lyrics for qualitative sources, using research done by educators of all cultural backgrounds for more quantitative sources. Uh, three sources will be used to validate the point being made. Yes, absolutely. Um, first things first, qu quantitative deals with numbers, statistics. Qualitative deals with like personal accounts, like diaries, journals. Um, rap lyrics are kind of like uh, poems um, of actual accounts that are going on at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, so why use rap lyrics? Um, rappers are today our modern day griots and jollies in West Africa. There's a culture of griots and jollies where um, these are the individuals that keep down the ancestral lineages. These are the individuals that uh, keep the historical accounts. These are the individuals that keep government laws. And these are also the musicians, the storytellers in the society um, the griot profession is, hered is hereditary. That means it's passed down from son to father, father to son, and has long been part of the West African culture. Um, the griot's role has traditionally been to preserve the genealogy, historical narratives, and old traditions of their people. Griots were musicians, like I said before, storytellers, and rappers are also the same way too. If if I put every rap, if I put a bunch of rap songs together, I could actually paint. Um, the history of African Americans from slavery from 1619 to present day. Dang. Right? I could legit put songs together, whether it's from Nas, Jay, uh, Raz Cast with the nature of the thread, whether it's Tupac, you could legit put songs together and paint slavery. If rappers were enslaved, were if rappers were um in America in 1969 to 1865, they would be rapping about slavery white oppression, whether yeah. it be rape, violence, um, their children being kidnapped, their daughters being taken away, they'll be rapping about that. So we see the things that's going on right now in New York City with drill music. Yeah. And they're blaming um, drill artists for it, but um, rap, gangster rap music was long after um, the crimes and drugs infested our community. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, um, they're not the cause of it. They're, they don't they definitely don't help the situation, but they mm. definitely are the cause of the situation. All right. right. Um, here's the agenda. Uh, the thesis today is being black in America is the most traumatic experience here in America. That is Dr. Steve Perry. I saw that on a Breakfast Club interview. And I'm going to encapsulate all that with the history of slavery, progression, sharecropping, progression, lynching, progression, civil rights, death of leaders, crack, progression, regression. Right. Um, until now, today in 2022, we've become our own instrument of our own oppression. We've become the reason why we oppress. Um, and that is due to these factors right here. Poverty, racism, fatherhood, violence, especially gang violence and our environment. Mm -hmm. All of these are 
um, affecting us in our decisions today in America. Mm. Few things you need to know before we even start this is what is psychological is ultimately biological. What this slide is basically saying is that anything that impacts our biological nature, that means um, whether it be verbal, physical, um, environmental trauma also in, impacts our mind, our psychology, our mental health. So our environment basically impacts our mind. Anything you want to say on that, Remy? Uh, I think there's a that's a that's a huge connection because a lot of the times where people experience certain traumas or certain you know mental health issues, they don't realize how it's a whole. You know, mm -hmm. they look at it as one part, like an isolated incident when it's all together. You know, uh, one thing leads to the other, one le one thing leads to the next, and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. if you want to become like a whole individual, then you got to deal with things um, collectively and not just isolated. So I definitely agree with that. Next, key for understanding the presentation, the past and the future is built on the past. The present and the future is built on the past. All right, whatever mm -hmm. that happens in the past, um, affects the present and whatever that happens in the present affects the future that's why we have to be willing to work on the present so that we could build a better future and we have to also remember the past so that we could understand what not to do for the future while we're mm. building presently in the present mm. statistics why are we including statistics 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 right um we've been seeing a lot of statistics being used in sports and professional um athletic events um like baseball basketball um the reason why we use statistics is life is about numbers probability and statistics are all related areas of mathematics which concern themselves with the analyzing the relative frequency of events which basically is statistics is basically a tracking of events that is occurring humans are part of those events mm -hmm. so every time a statistic is being a number a number on the statistics is being marked on um, or checked off or whatever, um, that's because an event is happening. And mm -hmm. based off that, those numbers of how many times that event occurs, science could use that to assumably predict um, a future event. So case in point, basketball, the layup is the most um, highly high percentage shot, mm -hmm. right? But that doesn't mean if 100 players take a layup, um, a hundred players are gonna make the layup. Right. It's just a higher percentage of players will make a layup than any other by anybody else because that's mm -hmm. the easiest shot. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. hundred percent will. Right. We could guess that based off taking a layup is the best shot. Right. We mm -hmm. can make that a assumption based off the numbers because the probability shows that. Right. Yeah. Um, we use probability in our life decisions every single day. Um, if it was going to work, we know the, 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 the route to go to work that's easier and we know the route that to go to work that's going to take us longer to get to work. Right. That's just every day. We make that based off um, events that happen in our minds of consistently practicing it, right? They even um, use these in our communities. Like, absolutely. for example, like the concept of the school to prison pipeline, looking mm. at the numbers and how kids in certain ages perform on certain exams and trying to dictate where those numbers are going to end up in the future. So yeah. numbers all over the place. And even in terms of our, our future oppression or our future traumas that we even going to experience before we even get there. So yeah. definitely agree. So basically you could basically, if you uh, statistic will show, if you put a, a bunch of kids in or like a, like a thousand kids, in a particular situation, whether it's poverty, whether it's violence, whether it's all types of uh, things that are going on in that community, and you put their probability up, there's going to be a high probability that most of the kids aren't going to be successful. Right. All right. Um, that's what statistics basically shows. Just basic. Um, are there outliers in statistics? Yeah, there's outliers in data and everything, um, in most things. Mm. So uh, that's something that uh, we're gonna address as we move on. There's an information gap. Um, if you know something, that means it was presented to you. Educate yourself. Um, this is the reason why we're doing this uh, PowerPoint is because again, it's okay for people to not know things. Um, this is a day and age where we could actually look through things on our phone. 
and um, we could find information in a blink. You know, what I mean, back mm -hmm. then it was a lot harder for for people to find information. We're we're definitely um, with information. We have a wealth of knowledge and information to, to get at our disposal. Mm -hmm. You know, what I mean, so we can educate ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean that people aren't miseducated, even though we have the tools to to educate ourselves. Right. And um, so um, there is an information gap, and of course, people that are um, that have more wealth in this country tend to have more information. People that have less wealth in this country tend to have less information. Um, and that's just my experience and your experience. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, people uh, been given credit advice for years and some certain things that I, I've learned as adults, adults already knew. I learned it from other adults who already knew about it, but it's not because of my lack of not seeking out information is the fact that they were presented with more information because they have the their parents probably had the opportunity you know resources to give them those information mm -hmm. and, um you can't tell you could tell somebody now um because the information is prevalent um with eyl shout out to eyl earn your leisure podcast of introducing people to financial literacy which a lot of people should go and watch um, so that you could pick up on traits that we could use to get more money. Cause that's mm -hmm. what it is. We need more, we definitely need more wealth, but we also need more information. Mm -hmm. I feel like information could lead to, um, uh, acquisition of wealth. 1619 project. Um, this is a project that, uh, a lot of our, um, politicians have been fighting for and a lot of the politicians have been against, um, so one of the first two English slave ships to carry West Africa to the New World was named Jesus. Its captain was Sir John Hawkins. There is no greater hope to be found in American history than in African resistance against slavery. Um, again, slavery was not only the law in um, the 1600s to all the way to the 1800s, it was the law. Um, it was also the the, the fabric of the economy in America and, and globally. Um, the North benefited from it, Europe benefited for it, from it, from the cotton, the cotton, the cotton textile industry. Mm. Um, the world benefited from slavery in America. Um, America's status now as a superpower is due to um, the work that African slaves put into the ground um, in their times of slavery from 1619 to 1865 and probably a little bit longer if you factor in um share cropped in mm -hmm. um and then it says uh from 1960 from 1619 to 1865 they may lack the self-confidence to take action in their own interests living with the shame and stigma of their status as slave survivors they might also suffer from ptsd due to the, tr the trauma inherited inherent in living in slavery and all the violence and exploitation that they went with, went with it. Ever since we touched America, we have experienced violence and trauma. And that is documented. I think a lot of people, uh, because slavery is, 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 is getting so far in the distant past that people forget how horrific it was. Um, we're not reading enough about it um, because people are trying to hide it. As we can see now, they're trying to hide it. And uh, we, we, no one gave those black slaves uh, mental health treatment for what they went through. Mm. Uh, it's a powerful book. Yeah, you know what I mean? And here's a book that outlines that, and I think everybody should pick it up, which is Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Joy DeGray. Um, and she put this in her book, which is Multi Generational Trauma Together with Continual Oppression absence of opportunity to heal or access to benefits available in the society leads to post-traumatic slave syndrome um, uh, you know they, they um you was in maker they made us um it's one of the books that actually recommended us and told us to read um being in undergrad and education department and like reading this so many things jump out of you like reading this and then going in the field and dealing with kids that look like you and seeing certain mannerism that they possess and certain mannerism that their parents even possess, like interacting with them, you see where it comes from. A lot of things in this book, like pull it out. You're just like, yo, and it makes you get a deeper understanding. You're like, yo, okay, I see where this is coming from. And 
the the multi generational uh, trauma and also like the absence of opportunities. Like today, I don't know. There's a lot of talk. If you look into a research, what they're doing is two things. They want to remove this from the history books moving forward, meaning they're not going to teach about it anymore. And also, they want to try to change the narrative, trying to paint a picture that slaves came here of their free will in search of opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think that speaks volume about creating a space for the opportunity to heal, because something is not going to go away or get better if you try to change the narrative on it or you try to downplay it like it never happened. It happened. We got to talk about it. I and think I recently sent you this. Um, mm -hmm. oh, you was about to say something? No, I was going to say that's why this this media platform and other media, black media platforms are important because it's to highlight the truth from, you know what I mean? The, 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 the physical evidence, um, the, the, the qualitative evidence that we share from our personal account, like mm -hmm. needs to be out there because people don't understand the extent of this, this event that took place for 400 plus years. Mm -hmm. um, and it still continues to this day. And that's what we're going to highlight what continues to this day that stems from this issue. But go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I just sent you. Uh, it's crazy that we talk about this because I just I just sent you an interview. I don't know if you saw it on Instagram of Shannon Sharp. He he recently spoke on this, um, and he asked him. I think the question was like, "Is it uncomfortable for white people to have the conversation about slavery?" And he gave a really good. I think everyone should look that up. He gave a really good um, analyzation of it. He was just like, "Yo." it's uncomfortable for them because they don't want to admit the atrocities that they did. But that is a part of healing and moving forward. That is a part of You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, epigenetics. You want to read this slide, Brody? Yeah. Epigenetics uh, is a study of how your behaviors and environment can cause changes that affect the way your genes work. Unlike genetic changes, epigenetic changes are reversible and um, and do not change your DNA sequence, but they can change how your body reads a DNA sequence. It's powerful. Yeah, I didn't. I, when I first read it, I knew. I, you know, when you read something, you're like, well, I know what this meant, but I really yeah. don't know what it means. Yeah. Um, this is one of the slides that um, I had to like sit with and ponder when I was reading it. Like, what does this really mean? And it just really means that your environment can change how your body reads your DNA because your DNA comes from your um, your uh, your ancestors. Mm. Um, we get you know we get some from our mom and we get some from our pops, but they get some from their palms and some from their pops, and it goes all the way down the line. We're legit made out of our ancestors. Our DNA mm. is composed of our ancestors. Mm. So whatever trauma that is in their DNA gets translated through our mm. DNA. But on top of that, the environment that we're in, whether it be um whether it be the the higher stress environments can also change our dna mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, there's a there's a great book um i don't want to deviate too much that expounds on this i believe it's called i forgot the author of it but it's called it's in um in terms of diet i think it's called eat right for your blood type and mm -hmm. it shows the history of eating and our genetic makeup in correlation with blood types so it goes back to the dawn of when we first arrived on Earth, and it shows the majority of the population was one particular blood type. I believe it was, it was O. But as we began to migrate and we began to experience different conditions and our diets began to change, it, the environment caused our blood type to change. So that way, things that we were consuming, our blood was able to, our body was able to consume it, break it down, so that way, you know, we could continue to function. But when, I was just thinking about that, but when you apply that, the way that we ate changed so that our blood type changed. But when you in, like think about that in terms of like the environment, what what can the environment do also do to our genetics? You know, because that book just focused on blood type. But what else is the environment doing to us? And your blood type, and your blood type is if I'm correct me if I'm wrong. Is that based off your DNA too, right? If I'm not mistaken, yeah, it is. But the but like it gave a really good analyzation of it. It was like crazy, like the way the body adapts to things that it encounters is, is amazing. So it makes you think about what about the things that we encounter in today? Is Absolutely. our body still changing from it? You know what I mean? Like, has it changed? like it's just crazy. Absolutely. All right, cool. Positive experience. This is from the center. This is what we use, you know, the professionals, the Harvard universities, all that stuff. You can see the, the sources on it. Um, 
This is the center of the development of children of child, developing child, Harvard University. Positive experiences such as exposure to rich learning opportunities and negative influences such as malnutrition or environmental toxins can change the chemistry that encodes genes and brain cells. A change that can be temporary or permanent. This is called epigenetic modification. The fact that genes are vulnerable to modification in response to toxic stress, nutritional problems, which we have in our community because we have food deserts in our community, and other negative influences underscores the importance of providing supportive and nurturing experiences for young children in the earliest years. When brain development is most rapid from a policy perspective, it is in society's interest to strengthen the foundation of healthy brain architecture in all young children to maximize the return on future investments in the child's health and workforce development. All right. Um, this is just basically speaking on providing uh, good food, um, good nurturing environment for children. Because again, mental health is past events that traumatize the body biologically, which then impacts the body psychologically. All right. So again, it's it's important for us to do that. This is from the Center of on Developing Child, and this is Harvard University. Now, intergenerational trauma. Um, intergenerational trauma is a phenomenon in which the descendants of a person who has experienced a, ter a, a ter terrifying event show adverse emotional and behavioral reactions to the event that are similar to those of the person himself or herself. These reactions vary by generations, but often include shame, increased anxiety, guilt, a heightened sense of vulnerability and helplessness. Low self-esteem, depression, suicidal, substance abuse, disassociation, hypervillage. How you pronounce that? Hypervillage. Hypervillagence. Uh, Hypervillagence, intrusive thoughts, and difficulty with relationships and attachments to others. Um, difficulty with aggression and extreme reactive, reactive, reactivity to stress. All right. Um, this is basically talking about how the trauma that we experience from our um, our ancestors come down to um, us. You're right, that's powerful. Um, which is, this is again, you could go look this up, intergenerational trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and I got the picture there, which I got. All this stuff is from Google. Please don't sue me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> please don't sue my, uh, I'm broke. Um, so, <laughs> Intergenerational trauma is when your ancestors, their trauma passes down to their grandchild and their grandchild, if they experience trauma, um, they pass it down to them and they already get that trauma from their grandparents. Mm -hmm. You know what's crazy, bro? What's up? Like thinking about what you just said, like this is, that's, that's crazy. And we know that when it comes to DNA, there's certain genes that may be present, but they may but they won't express themselves mm -hmm. or they will express themselves given the current environment. So these are things that are being passed down. Ooh, I didn't even think about that. You know right. Why having these conversations are important because now it sparks up new ideas. Right. So it's like these things could be passed down because of what our ancestors experienced. But imagine if we didn't live in the type of environment that we lived in. Would they, would they express themselves? Would they come out? Mm -hmm. that's, that's you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yep, that's true. <laughs> the environment could like bring out genes that are suppressed. Right, exactly. Basically, yep, yep, I, I definitely read on that, definitely. Mm -hmm. So we also got something called, if, even if we don't go through any of those things, we have something called collective trauma and shared trauma. Mm -hmm. You can read that for me. Yeah, collective trauma and shared trauma. The term collective trauma calls attention to the psychological reactions to a traumatic event that affects an entire society. Collective, collective trauma does not only represent a historical fact or event, but is a collective memory of an awful event that happened to that group of people. So the Holocaust is a collective trauma. Um, uh, and most high bless those people in Ukraine, the Ukraine right now, going through a collective trauma right now. Um, we've been through a collective trauma right now with COVID. Um, slavery was definitely a collective trauma. Um, and all these yeah. traumas 
we share it and we are also part of it. And that also seeing other people go through things is trauma. Um, so that's what basically collective trauma is. And again, all of these are very important from in putting the whole slide show into context. All right. So African-American mental health, the impact of collective trauma. When looking at the history behind this collective trauma, defined as tra trauma, traumatic psychological effect shared by a group of people of any size up to and including an entire society. So this is, this again, goes, supports the, the other claim of collective trauma. We can see how it traced back to 1619 when Africans were first brought to the United States through slavery followed by the impact of Reconstruction lynching that endured even until in 1981 and Jim Crow and most recently with police brutality and mass incarceration. This type of historical trauma is called post-traumatic slave syndrome, which was originally theorized by researcher Dr. Joy DeGray. The result of PTSS, which is post-traumatic slave syndrome, is adaptive behavior that are essentially survival mechanism employed by African Americans, which are passed down generationally. Mm. So this goes back into the um, the gene thing, which is again these survival mechanisms was passed down by African Americans because this is the way that we survive. And, and if mm. you're going to survive in a society that's trying to kill you or trying to oppress you or trying to beat you up, you have to come up with mechanisms to survive the same way. Be it me and Remy, we had to come up with survival mechanisms just to live in our area. There's certain things that we can't do. You know what I'm saying? There's rules. And those are rules. Those are not rules made by society. Those are rules because of survival. We can't, we know we can't do certain things, right? Right. Um, can you read this right here? These circumstances are these circumstances are all detrimental to mental health. However, due to the stigma associated with mental illness, many African Americans do not seek help. Also, a lack of mental health provide, uh, providers of color contributes to the reason why many are unwilling to reach out. That's and crazy. Hopefully, hopefully, again, the, the mental health has kind of been like, um, like poo pooed in our community because it's like, ah, oh, you're going through some 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 shit. Man up. Mm -hmm. um, it's all right, which is which is fine. That that two things could exist at the same in the same space. You, we gonna have to man up because mm -hmm. nobody's gonna save us, right? right? Except for ourselves. Um, we gotta man up. We gotta stop making bad decisions. That's a us problem. Mm -hmm. But um, we also have to to fix the problem in order for us to have strong mental health providers that could relate to our situation. Because um, from my experience going through the health. The health healthcare system in America is that we black men do get, um, we do we're we're gonna get underdiagnosed or we're not gonna be taken care of like other people mm. because of the stigma of who we are. Right, that's just a fact. That's my experience. I don't know about your experience, but I know that's my experience dealing with certain yes. um, mental um, providers, health mm. providers in general, whether it be doctors, surgeons. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we just need to be. We need to get through our mental health issues. That's why we come. We're, we're creating this PowerPoint so that we could reach the educational sphere of getting our degree, so that we could come back and support ourselves. Right. Um. So now we're done with what we need to know. Right. We just went through all these slides. These are things that we need to know before you get into the the, the trauma that we actually experience as mm -hmm. people of color in America. Mm -hmm. All right. Um. So the first. Um, the first topic that we're going to talk about to, again, to finalize this thesis, the thesis of um, being Black in America is the most traumatic experience here in America. That's what Dr. Steve Perry said. That's the one that that that, re that talked to me when I was listening to the Breakfast Club interview. And that's the one that we're going to actually show mm -hmm. through these through these slides. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, again, qualitative, quantitative sources. Here are the qualitative sources. Mm -hmm. um, this is from Davies. This is Blue Story. Um, we really get we really get treated filthy. The system got to be racist. I would be Ivy League if America played fair. Nas is talking about if if he was part of uh, if he was part of a better community, he probably would have reached the Ivy League. I'd be feeling like that too. Mm -hmm. um, 
they only care about a Negro when he's writing a rap. They only care about a Negro when he's dunking the balls, just speaking about the what um, the importance placed on athletics and entertainment in mm -hmm. our community other than academia. Um, and this is, again, J. Cole, I cry when I'm alone. I'm wondering why God sent me here, knowing that they hate us, knowing that they make us feel evil, so we kill our people without a second thought in every lesson taught by OGs. We full of real Negroes wisdoms. So we proceed like real Negroes who've been stripped of our humanities. I see the judge's eyes. I know that he doesn't understand me. So he's basically sent telling us that um, why did God send us to a place where um, we're experiencing racism and this racism is teaching us to hate our people mm -hmm. because it teaches us to hate ourselves. Um, and then we're learning lessons from people on the street, which is making us make decisions that we think are wise, but they're not mm -hmm. really wise. And then the judge, they don't understand where we're coming from because the judge is only looking at it from a law perspective. They're not looking at it from, damn, where did your, what, what environment did you come from? Right. That decision. That's what J. Cole was hitting that right here. And then again, 1990s, um, uh, Tupac's uh, White Man's World song, he says, you're going to bust in your fist against a stone wall. You're not using your brain. Again, brain, mental health. That's what the white man wants you to do. Look at you. What makes you ashamed of being black? Mental health. So tell the babies how I love them. Precious boys and girls born black in this white man's world. Um, again, looking at these lyrics, all of these lyrics spanned 20 years. Mm. Tupac wrote that verse in 1990s. J. Cole Ward wrote the verse in the teens. Um, you know what I mean? So all of this is, again, showing how his how hip-hop is basically putting together our historical uh, presence here in America. Hmm. So racism is a social construct. Um, with, the, with the 1776 edition of his book on the natural variety of mankind, German scientist Johann Frederick Blutenblatt is credited with creating one of the first race-based classifications. He decided on five categories, Caucasian, the white race, Mongolian, the yellow race, Malayan, the brown race, Ethiopian, the black race, and American, the red race. Again, this is his, kind of, this is his classification. Um, it's, again, race is, is a social construct that means it's been created within mm. society. It's not actually presently real. Mm. Uh, no one base um, their ethnicity on their race, mm. right? Um, race was just created to, um, to again, protect slavery. Mm. They just came up with the concept of natural rights for every human, and they couldn't validate slavery if every human had natural rights. So you had mm. to put humans in different categories in order for you to oppress them. Mm. That's why Hitler was a racist, because he put Jews in the category um, to oppress them. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why, you know, we we have these categories now. I don't like using those categories, but mm -hmm. these categories are used to. Um, they have right today's time, they have negative and positives to it, because the, net, the positives is we use those categories to come up with the statistics that we come up with that mm -hmm. we use on these slides to outlaw racism, right? To show racism. Right. But again, to a certain extent, it does reinforce racism at the same time because it was used in the beginning to separate people so that they could enslave them. Mm -hmm. um, if whites were in their own category with innate differences backed by science, then that category could be deemed superior. As a result, they could justify their own rights and freedom while enslaving and excluding and otherwise mistreating people who have been placed in different racial categories. My opinion, I feel like racism acts as a, 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 as a caste system in America um, to keep people of a different hue and poverty because we're mm -hmm. all different shades of, nobody's actually white and nobody's actually the color black. Yeah. People are just either really, really, really brown or really, really, really um, uh, light-skinned. Mm -hmm. um, so we got to like, under, once we understand that, then we get to understand the, 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 the racial categories. Um, racism and mental health, want to get through this slide? Yeah. So uh, 
Mental Health of America. People of color and all those whose lives have been marginalized by those in power experience life differently from those whose lives have not been devalued. They experience overt racism and bigotry far too often, which leads to a mental health burden that is deeper than what others may face. That's crazy. All right. Um, our second, our second point, racism is a mental health issue because racism causes trauma and trauma paints a trauma paints a direct line to mental illness, which needs to be taken seriously. So that aspect touches based on how all these concepts and ideas are connected, you know, one leads to another and one leads to another. So got to tackle the whole thing in order to get rid of the problem as a whole. Uh, past trauma is prominently mentioned as the reason that people experience serious mental health conditions today, but obvious forms of racism and bigotry are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to racial trauma. Every day, people of color experience far more subtle traumas. So even though it's subtle, it's still happening and it still affects us. You know, most people, uh, some people just could deal with it better than others, but others, sometimes this is the very thing that causes them to go off edge mm -hmm. and leads to more, you know, collective trauma and individual trauma. Um, people who avoid them and their neighborhoods out of ignorance and fear, banks and credit companies who won't lend them money to do to do so only at higher interest rates, mass incarceration of their peers, uh, school curricula that ignore and minimize their contributions to our shared history and racial profiling. Absolutely. Um, one of those things that stick out to me is that a subtle racism is mass incarceration of your peers. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that has absolutely, like, in your mind, you're like, well, how does people that you grew up with could get arrested mentally affect you? Yeah, it does. Cause it's like, damn, or am I next to get arrested? Right. Like I, I've grown up with people that got arrested for no reason. I have gotten arrested for no reason. You know what I'm saying? Multiple times got arrested for no reason, searched for no reason, pulled out of cars for no reason, uh, punched for no reason. You know what I mean? Beat up for no reason. Like these are things that actually happen. Um, so it's kind of like the constant mental health the, the mental health issue here is anxiety because you're mm. always in fear of what's going to happen and mm. racism and watching your peers uh go to jail is another um form of that trauma definitely i think we and, spoke on it in like previous episodes just that racism creates this environment where mm -hmm. you're in a constant state of survival absolutely. in a state that's only supposed to be temporary when you encounter some fear or you know some imminent fear that's putting your life at danger but now we're in this constant state of afraid to do things that normal people do there was things that, that came out recently like walking while black you know what i'm saying like sitting while black people were saying like how we're being incarcerated or harassed by doing typically daily activities that everyone else does and just thinking about that constantly you know is going to lead to some sort of mental you know illness or you know, just extreme stress. Absolutely. And this is from Mental Health of America. You go yeah. check this out. I, I didn't pick, I didn't make it up. Go read the article. <laughs> um, racism and individual mental health. Um, depression is the most commonly reported condition across people of color, Native Americans, Asians, every, all, this is, this is all, when I did this, when I read this article, this is across all racial groups right here, right? But particularly people of color. This one is only for people of color. Additionally, racial trauma can increase the risk of people of color meeting the criteria for PTSD. Importantly, stress plays a crucial role in how racism affects both physical and mental health. Stress hormones are released during stressful situations, and researchers have shown that both the experience and the observation of racial discrimination is stressful for children and adults who identify as people of color. The frequent presence of these stress hormones can lead to physical conditions like high blood pressure and heart disease, as well as mental health conditions like depression, anxiety, and overall poor health outcomes. Discrimination is typically sometimes something that occurs frequently and as a result creates a sustained level of stress and stress hormones in those who are most likely to experience discrimination. The Ethnicity in Health in America series is raising awareness about the psychological, I think that's sociological and psychological impact of racism and discrimination. That is actually uh, sociological, right? Mm -hmm. So 
Um, this is this slide is just basically pointing out that racism impacts our, our mental health through increasing our, our depression, anxiety, and overall poor health outcomes. Um, anything you want to add on to the slide? No, nah, I think you you touched on everything. And guess what? We talked about high blood pressure on this on this slide. Mm -hmm. Next slide is high blood pressure. So right. Blacks have the highest rate of cardiovascular diseases in the U.S., with about fifty seven percent affected by twenty thirty five. That figure is expected to rise to fifty percent. This is cover story. One size does not fit all. The role of sex, gender, race, and ethnicity in cardiovascular medicine go look up the article you can also look up other articles i saw plenty of articles that say that blacks are the leading people for not only high blood pressure i think it was diabetes and other things too uh, mm -hmm. please go look that up um racism and mental health experiencing racial discrimination and injustice can take a heavy emotional toll and trigger chronic stress anxiety depression and racial trauma this is again this is from health god this is the third source so we said in the beginning that we're gonna have three sources to validate what we're saying this is the third source um it also adds barriers for getting help for many black people or minorities there is a great disparity in access to mental health resources even if you have access to a doctor or a therapist you may still encounter discrimination within the healthcare system itself a lack of cultural understanding and prejudice on the part of medical professionals can result in a misdiagnosis or inappropriate treatment or even discourage you from continuing to seek help. Again, that's something that I named earlier. And this is again, um, where I probably, this, this is definitely where I got it from. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, uh, next, racism and mental health, another source. Um, please read the sources, the African-American experience by David R. Williams and Ruth Williams Morris. And this is first racism in societal institutions can lead to truncated and curtailed social economic mobility. This is basically saying that racism could help social, just institutional racism could help stop us from growing economically. And again, poverty, poverty is direct, is one of the most direct links to mental health issues, mm -hmm. right? Being poor does not, it hurts your mental health. We're gonna go into that a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. It says, second, experience, experience, experiences of discrimination can induce psychological, no, sociological and psychological reactions that can lead to adverse changes in mental health status. Third, in race conscious societies, the acceptance of negative cultural stereotypes can lead to unfavorable self evaluations that have delirious, uh, how you pronounce this word? Uh, uh, delirious. Delirious, I know. Delirious effects on psychological well-being research directions are outlined. Yeah, this is crazy. So basically, this is slide is basically talking about how mental health, racism affects not only our social economic status, but also um, our ability to move up the ladder mm. economically, but also our minds, right? Mm. Um, poverty. Now, um, see, this leads right into poverty. Poverty changed me. I was a decent kid. This is Davies talk to Big. Um, J. Cole and, and Taylor Two Cities, 2014. They're robbing people on the daily. Can you blame people who never had things? Damn. Uh, penitentiary chances just to make a couple bucks, 21 Savage on a lot. And then, you know, I got to go back to the 90s. Over the years, we were poorer than the other kids. This is Tupac on Mama. Again, you listen to these songs. A lot of these songs, again, are culturally relevant and are speaking, are describing the environments that they come from. Mm -hmm. uh, which makes us, which makes them our historians and which makes them our philosophers and our poets and our motivational speakers right here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, penitentiary chances just to make a couple bucks. That's true. That's crazy. A lot of African-Americans are in jail because they're making a penitentiary chances for money, mm -hmm. right? Um, the black white gap in multi-generational wealth. Uh, go ahead, you wanna read that for me? Uh, First bullet, black families experience higher rates of uh, poverty, less upward mobility, and more downward mobility. There are three mechanisms that could potentially give rise to racial gaps in poverty across multiple generations. First, if the initial poverty rates of earlier generations are, suffi are sufficiently large, then even if black and white Americans escape poverty at similar rates, black poverty will still remain more common over time. 
Crazy. Second, if Black Americans did not have higher poverty rates in earlier generations, racial gaps in poverty might persist or widen if Black upward mobility uh, out of uh, poverty is lower than mobility among white Americans. Third, even if Black Americans did not have higher initial poverty rates or less upward mobility, racial gaps might show up if downward mobility rates into poverty are higher for more Blacks than for whites. Um, in our analysis, we find that all three factors contribute to today's income gap. Black Americans experience higher initial poverty rates, less upward mobility, and more downward mobility. So every time you look at the statistics, there's always a disproportion. Like the ratio just never yeah. matches. Never and adds you know, up. And, and that, and that, and that doing research and reading about it is from the Freeman Borough. Um, people stealing money from the Freeman Borough. Seventy-two million dollars lost um, from that from that project that was meant to help African Americans after slavery. Um, we got the 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 fact that we did not get our forty acres in a meal. We got the fact that a lot of the laws and um, um, Laws and what's the other? I forgot the other word I'm going to use. But a lot of the the deals that FDR put in place after World War II and the, mm -hmm. and the Depression era mm -hmm. um, didn't really go to blacks. Um, a lot of a lot of rules that just didn't go to blacks. A lot of laws, a lot of help didn't go to blacks, which also contributes to um, to the the, uh, the 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 big income gap that we have today. Mm -hmm. Uh, another one. Um, again, this slide is just to show that we are in poor. We're poor. Um, majority of us are poor. Uh, and again, it says big gender is a big part of the, the story too, as detailed in a newspaper, a new paper, a newspaper from the Equality of Opportunity Project: Race and Economic Opportunity in the United States, an intergenerational perspective. All those authors. As always, there is a huge amount of data and analysis in the new paper, but the big finding is that race gaps in intergenerational mobility will largely reflect the poor outcomes for black men. The report is another contribution to the growing literature showing that race gaps in the intergenerational persistence of poverty are in large part the result of poor outcomes for black men, right? Again, signifying that um, Historically, the man being the provider isn't the provider in our community as much, right? Um, this is because black women continue to have substantial low levels of household income than white women, both because they are less likely to be married and because black men earn less than white men. Uh, go check out this research. The inheritance of black poverty. It's all about the men. Go check it out. Um, research show black boys are most likely to be stuck in a cycle of poverty. Black boys raised in America, even in the wealthiest families, still earn less as an adult than white boys with similar background. Again, it just speaks on the poverty that exists in our community. Um, even when you're, even if when you when you have money, a lot of times that we make so much bad decisions that we we have money and then we run out of the money based off those bad decisions, and a lot of times we're just born without money. Mm -hmm. um, and the people the very few people that are able to master this information that they receive, like Jay-Z, like LeBron, um, like other black celebrities who are consistently gaining wealth, mm -hmm. they have information that we don't have. And that's all they did. They just gained the information. Right. And then slack and be like, damn, we went, we came from these communities. And now that we're, we're gonna use that as a crutch, um, no, they was like, okay, yeah, we come from these communities. We don't get this information. We don't get this money. And then we don't continue living the life that we want to live. Mm. All right. Uh, children from families living in poverty are three times more likely on average to suffer from, um, psychotic conditions, uh -oh. psychiatric conditions, including both externalizing disorders, such as ADHD, oppositional defiance disorder, um, and conduct disorder and internalizing disorders such as depressions, anxiety, and poor coping skills. So children from live, from families living in poverty are three times more likely. Again, it's not saying that because you come from a poor family, you're going to 
have these disorders, you're just more likely to have these. It increases disorders. the likelihood of it. it. Increases the likelihood of having it. I think people are gonna think, well, just because we read it, oh, you must have it. Right. That's part of the argument that we're saying. But the argument that we're saying at the end, hopefully, is that all of this combined, you're gonna about to have four out of the five, mm -hmm. three out of the five, or two out of the five. And based off your DNA, which our DNA is known to be traumatized, mm -hmm. our ancestors, we just we just read that earlier, plus the, the plus the environmental effects, all that combined is what's gonna is what makes being black mm -hmm. in America the most traumatic experience. And again, any trauma does in our biology also occurs where? In our mind. Mm -hmm. Right. Um want to improve mental health. Reducing poverty is key. Um, again, go read the article. This is from Kenneth E. Miller, PhD. He did the studies on it. He said, poverty is a major cause of psychological distress around the world. Poverty exposes people to a host of stressful conditions from unsafe and overcrowded housing to poor health care, food, instability, insecurity. It's crazy. Poverty-related stress not only causes anxiety and depression in adults, it compromises parenting which endangers ch children's mental health. Poverty redu reduction programs have a demonstrated effect on improving mental health. Their impact, if brought to scale, could be far-reaching. Po poor families have a much harder time accessing and affording healthy food. Low-income families in the United States often have limited access to markets selling healthy groceries leading to a reliance on cheaper, unhealthy processed foods that contributed to higher rates of obesity and other health problems. Mm -hmm. Poor health, in turn, is linked to poor mental health. Mm -hmm. Simply put, it's stressful and depressing to be sick. Poverty reduction is good for mental health. There is a clear evidence that reducing poverty improves mental health. This has been demonstrated in numerous studies in diverse settings from deeply impoverished communities in low-income countries to poor families in the United States and Europe. Here are a few examples. Increasing, increase in the U.S. minimum wage are associated with decrease in suicide. In one study, just a dollar increase was associated with a 3 to 5% drop in suicide. Imagine uh -huh. what the impact on mental health might be of increasing the U.S. federal minimum wage from 7 point seven dollars and 25 cents to 15 dollars as many have proposed again this is an older article mm. so um, i think the men i think the minimum wage is about that right now right things like 15 percent right now i think it's 15 dollars right now isn't it yeah in, in new york in new york right yeah so again um this 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 article by kenneth um mm. e miller mm. um is just bringing to 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 light how poverty and mental health illness connects with each other. Mm. All right. Um, let me go back real quick. All right, cool. This is the last slide. Social economic status, SES, is based on factors such as family income, parents, education, and neighborhood poverty. As low SES in childhood is associated with poor outcomes in adulthoods across many domains. How and why SES disadvantage sets the stage for negative outcomes in adulthood has been recently uncovered by brain science scientists. Poverty shrinks the brain, social economic status have important effects on brain size and organization, which is which is true because when humans first when humans first came on the scene, they were eating very um, some people argue they were eating very good. Other people argue that um, the invention of agriculture, the discovery of agriculture, helped the development of the brain, um, made us be able to sit down and talk about our ideas because now we have a constant food surplus around our bits. Then now we could not only increase the population, but also have time to sit down and talk about religion, laws, and writing, right? So food definitely helps you with your with your brain development, right? Next slide. So now we went over racism, we went over poverty, we got fatherhood left, violence left, and environment left. So fatherhood is, I blame my pops for that shit because 
if he didn't fail, he could have corrected me. That's 21 Savage on J. Cole's song, My Life. Um, this is the, the game on like father, like son. Remember me, like father, like son. Had a million dollars for our one because my daddy hustled. We good now because my daddy hustled. We out the hood now because my daddy hustled. Um, and then Tupac, Dear Mama, 1990s. Now ain't nobody tell us. Now ain't nobody tell us it was fair. No love from my daddy because the cow wasn't there. He passed away and I didn't cry because my anger wouldn't let me feel for a stranger. They say I'm wrong and I'm heartless. But all along, I was looking for a father. He was gone. I hung out around the thugs. And even though they sold drugs, they showed a young brother love. Um, again, going back to the, the financial aspect of it. In America, it's becoming increasingly important for you to have two individuals that earn high incomes. You know what I'm saying? So it's becoming very important for us to do that, right? Um, so to, to have an absence of a father is tough on any, with any race or any ethnicity or any male, female, it's tough to not have a father anywhere. You know what I mean? That's tough. Um, I remember I was telling you earlier this week that growing up, I made both my first year out of college, not even my first year, my first month out of college, I made more than my mom and my dad combined. And my first job, you know what I'm saying? My mom was at, my mom has always been between 25 and 33,000 a year. Single family, no other support, you know what I'm saying? So I could imagine. How what she went through only making from 25 to 33,000 for my whole life. I've been with living with her for like 24, 25 years. So that's crazy within itself. You know what I'm saying? Anything you want to add on to that? No, I can't hear you muted yourself, bro. No, I think you was dogs over here. So I mean, <laughs> I only had to pick up the mic, but yeah, I think you, you. I think you hit the, the ham on the nail. Plus, we did touch on this in, in past videos, too. So it's just providing emphasis on that. All right, cool. Children and single parent families by race in the United States. Um, 66, we've been around the 66% mark since 2010. This is um, data center, that kids count. Um, you can go look this up. This is mm. not this is the children and single parent families by race in the United States. We account for most, even though we're not majority of the population, we're at 66%, which is higher than non Hispanics, whites. But in the numbers, um, of course, white people have more single parent households than blacks, but again, they don't have the same economic thresh threshold as um, black Americans. Um, and they don't, again, they don't deal with the same issues as we do. Um, but again, we're at the highest of all, out of all the ethnicities in America or races, we have the highest percentage. Mm -hmm. It's not number wise, but percentage wise. Um, the share of black children born to single mothers have, has been more than tripled from the, from 24% in 1960 to nearly 70% in 2018, including indicating that black fathers are less likely to live in households with their children than fathers of other races. Mm -hmm. But it's important to note that it's important to note the share of children in single mother families among all races has risen dr dr drastically mm -hmm. since the 1960s. Moreover, we now know that among non-residential fathers, black fathers are more involved than Hispanic dads and share more responsibilities and generally co-parent better than white or Hispanic non-residential fathers. Mm -hmm. Still, non-residential black fathers face a my myriad of barriers to being a stable, consistent supporters to their children because of other systematic challenges. And again, um, we I was just on social media the other day, I had post how finances is one of the biggest um, reasons for divorce. Mm -hmm. And again, it says right here, black fathers don't have the ability to get that stable, consistent support. And of course, yeah, that has to do with the issues, but it also has to do with mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that we 
Yeah, we're bringing out this information. We're bringing out this information so that you can know the information, so that you could understand that this is not going to change overnight. You know what I mean? It's not going to change because I'm putting it on a couple slides. It's going to change with the mental, the mind. And um, your, whatever you believe in your mind, your body's going to follow. Mm. That's what anything. Whatever you believe in your mind, your body's going to follow. So we have to create that space in our mind, even though the world is trying to penetrate it with negativity. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's great. Um, again, uh, this is from the same article. Mm. Uh, uh, it says, differentiating educational outcomes are also a barrier to success for Black families. Black males, for example, still experience greater impediments to graduate from college when they do they are more likely to graduate from other nonprofit institutions with larger amount of college debt. Physical and mental health disparities are another factor really addressed as significant to the well-being of fathers of, of people of color. For example, black men experience the worst health outcomes of any other demographic group. And at age 45, black men have a life expectancy that is three years less than the non-Hispanic white men. Poor health, is often symptomatic of poverty. Health, mm -hmm. in turn, has an impact on sustaining on sustained poverty. This clinical relations, relationship must be unpacked when identifying why poverty is predominantly the plight of certain marginalized people. Again, saying this is this one very sticked out. This one sticked out to me because it says poor health is often symptomatic of poverty. So poor health and poverty are like hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, anything you want to add on to that before we move on? Are you focused? I see you got a lot going on in the back. No, nah, I don't have a lot. I'm just trying to, because there's a lot going on in my neighborhood. That's why I'm muting and stuff. I don't want like the, the mic to pick up anything. Uh, so I keep like on? moving. Yeah, I'm Russia, not in Brooklyn no more. So Russia's, in, Russia's in Texas right now? This dude. <laughs> nah, I'm not in Brooklyn no more. So it's like, mm -hmm. I'm still getting used to the environment. But gotcha. um, what would I add on to that? Nah, actually, nah, I think this, this article, if I was supposed to add on anything, it would be what you was initially talking about, about how cause they're saying divorce rates is at an all-time high. And, you know, the father being absent from the house is definitely a contributor to the mental health illnesses that these young kids develop. You and I didn't grow up in a, in a household like that. And I, I don't know about you, but I think we, we talked about it before. We're both still dealing with certain things, you know, in our adulthood because of not having that close bond and relationship with our father. And I just feel like that's something that needs to, we need to see a decrease in that. And instead, we're seeing an actual opposite increase in it. So, Absolutely. yeah, that's what I'll add on to that. And I hope you guys are like looking at the title of these articles. So you could go back and like look at it because this is some powerful things in here. Oh, yeah. And I don't want people to feel like, you know, we're like cherry picking nah, know, the I things think, that we're reading. I think with any presentation, you got to go back and do your own uh, yeah. self assessment and own research. We just presented the information to bring awareness to it. So hopefully mm -hmm. people can look at it and be like, oh, snap, let me go do my own research. Let me all go my own help. You know what I'm saying? Let's yeah. go through this because we still got like a whole bunch more. And I'm still trying to keep this under two hours, right? So this is www.allforkids.org. This is 10 facts about father engagement. Fathers and infants can be equally as attached as mothers and infants. When parents are involved with their child, infants are attached to both parents from the beginning of life. Father involvement is related to positive child health outcomes in infants, such as improved weight gain in preterm infants and improved breastfeeding rates. Father involvement uses authoritative parenting, loving and with clear boundaries and expectations, leads to better emotional, academic, and social and behavior outcomes for children. It's basically saying that the father being that father figure there who's also, who's loving but also setting clear expectations, which is very important because we know as teachers, we got to set clear expectations in our classrooms mm -hmm. and clear boundaries so kids can know um, what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. And fathers do that. And then children who feels a closeness to their fathers are twice as likely as those who do not to enter college 
or find stable employment after high school. 70% less likely to have a teen birth. Um, 80% less likely to spend time in jail. So this is 75% is a lot. Yeah. 80% is a lot. Mm. This is this is children who feel closeness to their fathers. 70%, 75% of them are likely to have a teen birth. Again, we, we don't have closeness to our fathers. So we don't fall into the 75%, but other people do. I know a vast majority of people do. When I was going to high school, my high school was legit named, nicknamed Clara Abortion. Right? I remember that. <laughs> so 80% less likely to spend time in jail and half is likely to experience multiple depression symptoms. So not only being close to your father is more, you're more likely to not go to jail if you're close to your father, mm -hmm. but it's also you're less likely to experience depression symptoms. Fatherhood mm -hmm. occupy a crucial role in child development. Fathers, father absent hinder develop. Fathers, father absent hinders development from early infancy through childhood and into adulthood. The psychological harm of father absence experienced during childhood persists throughout the life course. Uh, the quality of father-child relationships matters more than the scientific amount of hours spent together. Non-residential fathers could have positive effects on children's social and emotional well-being, as well as academic achievement and behavioral adjustment. High levels of father involvement can, are correlated with high levels of social, of sociability, confidence, and self-control in children. Children with evolved father, involved fathers are less likely to act out in school or engage in risky behaviors in adolescence. Mm -hmm. Children with actively involved fathers are 43% more likely to earn A's in school and 33% less, percent less likely to repeat a grade than those without engaged dads. Fathers' engagement reduced the frequency of behavior problems in boys while also decreasing delinquencies and economic disadvantages in low-income families. Mm. Fathers' engage, engagement reduces psychological problems and rates of depression in young women. Mm -hmm. Overall, the impacts that fathers and father figures can make is substantial. Just as there are many positive aspects of father involvement, the effects of father absence can be detrimental as well. Um, and you know what's crazy? Just, yeah, go ahead. Some will say, like, not to sound like a conspiracy theorist, some will say there's actually an objective and an agenda to purposely remove the black man from the home. And look mm -hmm. what happens in the absence of the black man. All these things. I um I, I don't like conspiracy theories. Um, I said some will call it a conspiracy theory. I, some have, some I heard that conspiracy theory before, but I still feel like it's still a personal decision. It's a personal decision in who you're mating with. Mm -hmm. It's a personal decision of the conversations that you're having with the person that you're with. Um, because again, marriage is a commitment. Mm -hmm. So these these situations and having a child is also a commitment. Um, so that's why I don't really go into conspiracies because at the end of the day, it's still a choice. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's a it's a choice. It's a high level choice, but it's still a choice within itself. That if you don't make the right choices, could have um, circumstances that we have today. But again, poverty, um, link are link. People who make more money mm -hmm. tend to stay longer together. That's the that's the, just the, the information. But yeah. it doesn't have to be that way. You know, what I mean, we can make the decision. To stick together because again we're all in this together. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? The situation, the situation of not having enough professionals not only affects me, but it affects you. It affects the community. Um, you know what I mean? A boy shooting up the the, the area because of people not teaching him right. That doesn't affect. That doesn't only affect their parents. It only affects me too. I might walk down the block and get shot too. Right. But that's because of you know what I mean that's parenting though you know what I'm saying, so it just needs we need both parents to be engaged. Um, father absence home implications again, we brought this out. You can look through it. Um, the first thing is perceived abandonment. That's true. Um, the question that, that a young person asks himself is why the father is there, why the father isn't there. Mm. Um, attachment issues. That is also true. Childhood child abuse. That varies from person to person childhood obesity varies from person to person because a person could be skinny um being raised in poverty too criminal adjustment involvement yeah we're like the most incarcerated 
Um, gang involvement, again, what Tupac said in his lyric when he says that he didn't, first he named that he didn't grow up with a father. And then in the second um, thought, he's saying that, yo, even though I didn't grow up with a father, I had people around the block that showed me love. Right. Which then in, goes into gang involvement. Because again, the whole thing is lo love helps your mental health. It betters your mental health. Mm -hmm. Right? And that sense of love and togetherness betters your mind. You can go look this up. Yeah. Well, what I say is what I research. Right? And a lot of times when you're young and you're around people that are giving you encouragement, that's giving you purpose, that's giving you a uh, direction, even though that direction is negative, you're going to want to be around them. Right. Giving you that love that you, that you lost earlier. And I always say that, you know, if there was more fathers present, there would be less gang members. Yeah. Right? Mental health issues, poor school performance, poverty and homelessness, substance abuse. These are all the effects that you could go look up to this article. This is the Minnesota uh, Psycholog Psychological Association. Psychological mm. Association. All right. Mm. So look up this article. Um, father absences. It says, according to 2007 um, report, this is UNICEF report UNICEF. On, on the well being of children and economic advance nations children in the u.s canada and the uk rank extremely low in regards to social emotional well-being in particular many theories have been explored to ex to explain the poor state of our nation's children however a factor that has been largely ignored particularly among child and family policymakers is the prevalence and devastating effects of father absence in children's lives mm -hmm. the starter studies repeatedly show that children without fathers positively present in the home suffer greatly. Mm -hmm. Even before a child is born, their father's attitude regarding the pregnancy behavior during the prenatal period and the relationship between their father and mother may indirectly influence risk for adverse birth outcomes. In early childhood, studies show that school-age children with good relationship with their fathers were less likely to experience depression, to exhibit disruptive behaviors, or to lie. Overall, they were far more likely to exhibit pro-social behaviors. Same thing right here. Just, again, go read this article. Again, this is from, um, let me go back. This is from Father Absence 2007 UNICEF report. Go look it mm -hmm. up. But it's, all of this is from um, uh, this particular source right here from the Minnesota Psychological Association. Please go check that out. Read that for yourself. Um, we're going to move on in the interest of time. Psychology Today, again, back that up again. Um, many theories still trying to figure out. They're not having it. I don't think they, I don't think it's a theory no more. I think it's a direct correlation, fathers to absent children. Mm -hmm. Right. This is from Edward um, Kerf, PhD. Black teachers slash black rollouts, we matter, right? We need more black teachers. I think there's 2%. I had this in my um, PowerPoint. Um, by every metric, having a black teacher in um, the schools are helping us, our students, um, propelling them to getting better mm -hmm. grades, motivating them. Um, and they're very crucial. It says here, these skills and mindsets are crucial, especially now as black students face a new wave of trauma initiated by police violence against black bodies and schools grappling with the ways in which um, they often perpetuate racist systems. Because again, mm -hmm. we're a, we're, America was built um, on, the, on this concept of racism because slavery was mm -hmm. the backbone of America at one point. Right. So it was built on this concept of racism. So a lot of things that we do today, we don't realize are racist to the kids, but they're just unknowingly racist to the kids. Um, and again, racism is just a system of oppression because of, a, of, of the skin color of the individual, right? Right. Almost there. Black male teachers aren't enough. It's about 2% black male teachers. We definitely need more. Black male teachers, what do you think about that? I agree. Um, 
I agree. It's a it makes a, a huge difference. Um, I think you and I we spoke on it briefly too. Um, we didn't start seeing black teachers. I, well, I didn't get my first male black teacher when I until I got until I hit college, mm-hmm. and that is like that speaks volumes. And the interaction that I had with him was definitely more different than any interaction I had with other teachers growing up. So, and even like being like being an educator in elementary, just seeing the way students respond to a male black figure, it's crazy. Like sometimes like not to like throw shade on female teachers because they're, they're effective educators, but just like the, the interactions is different. Like I would see like the energy in a classroom will be different. Like let's say a teacher, like let's say my students had a sub and it was a female teacher. Like they will have a particular type of energy. And then if I came back from prep and I walked through the classroom, energy would just change. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, it's crazy. And I just think that like, that's impactful. We need to see more of that in um, our communities and our schools. Absolutely. Absolutely. Violence. Um, uh, I'm from Marcy Project. I'm from Marcy Housing. Houses where the boys die by the thousands. Back when Pam was with on Martin. This is Jay-Z talking about Marcy's projects in the 90s um, being very violent. I'm from Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. It was. Um, we don't participate. Ain't with the squashing-ish. All we believe is in homicides. Mm-hmm. And that's in 21 Savage My Life. That is true. All them kids do believe in homicides. Mm-hmm. Um, and they go into jail for it, as they should. Um, <laughs> um, Lord knows if I try. Been a witness to homicides, scenes, drive-bys, taking lives, little kids die. Wonder why as I walk by. This this is basically Tupac reflecting on the two things that the top rappers said of being a they they're talking about committing seeing homicides and someone is talking about committing homicides. And the other one is talking about, well, damn, like why is these things taking place? Mm-hmm. Um that says fool. Fool, death ain't nothing but a heartbeat away. I'm living life, do or die. What can I say? I'm 23 now, but will I live to see 24? I don't even know. I don't even know. <laughs> you know what I mean? But a lot of these songs really like when you really like when I listen to rap music, it's it's a real it, it the feelings and the sentiments, I felt them, most of them. Any rapper that I'm a fan of. It's because I feel what you're rapping about. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna listen to you. Like I, I can't listen to certain rappers because I can't, I can't vibe with them on that level. You can't relate. So it's like can't it's relate like, to them, yeah. right? Um, so a lot of these things that they're saying, like I have felt like I wasn't gonna make it to 21. I have felt like I was gonna make it to 25. 21, 25. That's yeah. that's high. That's too high for me. <laughs> uh, I also seen kids die and be like, I seen when I was going to middle school, I saw this kid, one of the one of my classmates. He was younger than me, but he was part of the same school. Get shot um, because he was he had a mean mug face. Mm. This was in middle school, and I was like, man, why you had to shoot him because he had a mean mug face? And this is just he was just walking in the street randomly. You know what I mean? I have seen plenty of senseless violence. That don't need to be. That don't need to happen. Um, Crazy, and it's heavy in our neighborhood. It's not just one. It's not just two. It's not just three. It's just a whole Sometimes bunch. Sometimes it will be like two or three in a week. My growing up and um, shot. growing up in the projects, my <laughs> my brother, my older brother, he was on his way to work, and he literally saw someone get shot in the head, and the 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 brains, bro, the brain matter, like mm-hmm. in front of his feet. Like literally, like yeah. almost stepped in it and everything. I'm just like, bro, like. And that's it. Mm. I, I've seen people get shot, but not. I've seen somebody get their head t- taken off, but um, not that close. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it's it's at the moment you're like, God damn, right. But at the moment you're like, oh, sh- let me duck. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So it's not, and then you like, oh snap, I'm alive. Yeah. You know, okay, let me let me stay away from that dude, mm-hmm. or let me not go down to that block, or let me make sure I'm good because that dude might live in your area. And just think about that because he was on his way to work, mm-hmm. and he still so, had to go to work. 
You still have to go. <laughs> Imagine you going to work doing an overnight shift. Mind you, you're supposed to be sleeping already, mm-hmm. and that's on your mind. And you staying up, replaying that shit. Yeah, of course. That that's the thing that we deal with that we don't we don't say. Like, imagine waking up and the and, and the FBI is in your building, right? Trying to figure yeah, out. I mean, this like with 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 not those no small nine mil no block. These are these are like high caliber rifles and weapons that can shoot multiple rounds in your building, right? Multiple times. You know what I'm saying? So it's like a war zone. Um living in, in areas like that. And again, whatever whatever is biological is so psychological. Right. So again, PTSD, the hood disease. This is uh this has been a theory that's been like bounced around. I just want to get the context around it. Some people believe it, some people don't believe it. As a person that witnessed it, I actually I absolutely believe it. Mm-hmm. Um it says when folks think of post traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, the first thing that usually comes to mind is veterans. However, there is a very close parallel to the atmosphere of war, to the atmosphere of living in the inner city. The things that some individuals who live in urban areas are exposed to can often be traumatic. From Mm. poverty to gang violence, people in the inner cities witness events that do not typically transpire in suburban areas. And again, me and you, we change locations. Yeah. And it would change the location, it's definitely a change of perspective. Um, definitely, you just see life a little bit different, breathe a little different. Um, these experiences lead to this notion of a hood disease. I didn't like that they put the term hood disease in there, but I get what they were doing. <laughs> um, many studies have been conducted that come to the conclusion that the connection between inner city youth and PTSD can lead to violence. Not only is this a criminal justice issue, but a public health one as well. Mm. What is being done to address it? I, I have seen how PTSD affects both population veterans. My father, this is the person speaking about their personal okay. accounts. My inner city clients, my inner, the inner city youth, my clients, there are many commonalities in their behavior and how it manifests in them. What is also interesting to me is that my father was an inner city kid. Did being in the Vietnam War exacerbate his PTSD? Constantly looking over your shoulder and not being able to sit with your back towards the door are two things that my father and my clients have in common. Now, mm. he's speaking to um, something that is unique. Because, um, again, I'm not, me and you are not privy to um, looking behind our backs. Mm. We're privy of being active and seeing, oh, snap, okay, what's, what's going on? And, like somebody got shot, okay, we can't go there. Right. Oh, we don't want to get jumped. We don't want to get robbed. Um, being poor, being picked off, being poor. Like we're used to that. Mm. But gang violence is a total different animal. You know what I mean? Right. I know a couple people that have been part of um gangs and sets, and their trauma is they're our trauma, but add an extra times five because they're part of the individuals that are shooting. They're part of the individuals that are getting shot. Mm-hmm. Um, well, of course, not all gang members get get that treatment, but they're they're right there. You know what I mean? I remember when I was walking out, I was about to go walk out. Me, my boy, shout out to Gio. Oh, you about to go out, and I'm walking out my door, and I'm like, and then I'm walking to another door, and as soon as I walk through the other door, I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot my phone. I run inside, grab my phone, I run back. I, I'm 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 leaving my apartment door again. Mm. To go back outside, and all I'm hearing is bah, bah, bah. So, I mean, you know, close the door, lock the door, and you know, go to the window, see what's going on. Um, which, which was not smart, but um, uh, go to the window, see what's going on, and next thing you know, you see a body being held up because that person got shot. And all you're thinking about is like, oh, if I had left my crib earlier, I would have got that would have been Brilliant. dodging bullets too. Um, which, of course, me, me, me and you had to. Um, mm. growing up in what we grew up, but that's just one of those events that I'm like, yo, like, even though I didn't get shot, I could see the result of him getting shot, and what would that lead to me to for me to be feeling that trauma that I see him on the floor and bleeding out, um, was something that you know that that sticks with you for a long time. Mm. 
All right, it says, ah, this is from Greg Johnson Penn today. Uh, African Americans know pain and trauma all too well. From the evils of the Middle Passage to the tortures of slavery to lynchings to medical experiments. There's a good book on medical experiments and how the profession of GYN came from these experiments. And forced sterilization. Widespread video of police brutality is their most recent torment. A, a medical expert, psychologist, educator, clinical psychiatrist, and senior administrator, ordained minister, had a lot of titles, discuss how watching videos of police violence against black people is detriment is detrimental to African American mental health. Mm -hmm. the, now this is talking about the average annual 1993 to 1995. I was born 95. You was born 96, right? 95. You was born 95 too? Yeah. Nah, my bad. All right, it says <laughs> violent crime rate in urban areas was about 75% higher than the rural rates and 37% higher than the suburban rate. Urban males experience violence, violent victimization at rates 65% higher, right? So again, men experience violence, we experience it, even though we're not a part of it, again, that shared collective trauma of seeing them mm -hmm. get shot makes us a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, African American youth, African American teenagers are three to five times more likely than, than European American youth to be murdered. Um, this is 1991. Again, I was born in 1995. The murder rates in the early 90s was crazy in our community. And this is just to show you that the murder rates was. But then you're like, well, this is 2022. How does this relate to you? Again, anything that is psychological is biological. And again, my mom was around that time. So whatever trauma she experienced, she's mm. bringing it to me. Whatever yes. trauma that I was being experiencing while I was a baby, whether all the shooting, whatever, I was also experiencing, even though I didn't have information in my head to, mm -hmm. to ingest it or comprehend what was going on, mm -hmm. it still was fearful for me because my mom was fearful. Right. You know what I'm and saying? That's not even not, and that's not even that far off. Like, yeah. Come on, we was born ninety five. All these things were happening in the nineties, ninety ones. Like mm -hmm. even when you think about slavery. even now, even now, you know what I mean? Like we still right. like, you go to our community right now, it's still violent. Like just the other sure. day, you know, gang <laughs> bunch like toy. For some reason, when I was in, in middle school, there was a huge gang bus. 20, mm -hmm. 30 people. When I was in college in high school, there was gang buses. Mm -hmm. I'm adult. There's still gang buses. There was gang buses in 1995, 1994. There was gang buses all throughout. Big convictions. Bunch of people going to jail. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So these things are like prevalent, prevalent, prevalent in our time, even to this day. Oh. Right? So impact of gun violence on Black Americans. Black Americans are disproportionately impacted by gun violence. They experience 10 times the gun homicides and 18 times the gun assaults injury, and nearly three times the fatal police shootings of white Americans. Gun homicides actually and police shootings are disproportionately prevalent in historically underfunded neighborhoods and cities. This lack of funding intensifies our country's longstanding racial inequities. Again, just highlighting the fact that we go through a lot of violence. Um, gun violence alone reduces the life expectancies of Black Americans by four years, and yet the U.S. largely ignores the external systematic factors driving inequality and violence in the Black community. Black Americans are twice as likely as white Americans to die from gun violence and 14 times more likely than, than white Americans to be wounded. A documented 4,084 Black people were lynched in 73 years, 93,262 were shot dead in 14. Like lynchings, gun violence is a racial justice issue. Um, we, we, are, we already see that. Um, it says Black people are not inherit, inherently more violent. Sadly, violence is a capacity that all humans share. Um, white men, for instance, commit the majority of mass shootings, and when faced with poverty, unemployment, and single-parent households, they are more likely to commit homicides and other violent crimes than Black men confronting um a similar set of cultural or systematic imp impediments right um but we you know face 
racism systematically. Uh, next, violence in its many forms can affect the health of people who are targeted, those who are the paper perpetrators and the community in which both live or in which both live. So the people that are perpetrating the violence in the, in the community get affected by that violence, right? In this article, we review the literature on the health consequences of many forms of violence, including child physical and sexual abuse, intimate partner of violence, elderly abuse, sexual violence, youth violence, and bullying. The biological effects of the violence have become increasingly better understood and include effects on the brain, neuroendocrine system, and immune response. Consequence include increasing incidence of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, disorder, suicide, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, and premature mortality. The health consequences of violence vary with the age and sex of the victim as well as the form of violence. People can be victims of multiple forms of violence and the health effects can be culminating, culminative. Any comments on this? Nah, I think that's self-explanatory. <laughs> it's just crazy how like all these numbers and statistics of things that are going down in our communities and you know what I'm saying the impact that it has on everybody, you know, that's every true. stage of our life. And then when we try to do things like this or programs to you know combat these things or see a decrease in it, we get some pushback on it. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Wow, it's like, huh? Absolutely. Yeah, it's like, oh, why do you guys keep doing this? Why do you guys keep talking about it? What? I'm like, what do you mean? Like, look We're at the numbers, the statistics. Yeah. yeah, you know what I mean? We're still affected by it. And the yeah. stuff that we, again, the stuff that we do to protect ourselves from violence is to protect ourselves with other methods of violence. So if I'm going to protect myself in that neighborhood from getting robbed or getting shot at, I got to have a knife. Even though a knife is not going to work, it's going to protect me, which I did. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, you carried it for protection. You don't know when you're going to get robbed. You don't know when somebody's going to come with a gun. It's just that constant fear of every day when you step out, like that doesn't stop that person coming out a, uh, on a Tuesday, then a Monday don't stop that person from being poor and wanting to commit a crime. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like that doesn't stop it. Um, mm -hmm. And it says here, exposure to violence carries numerous potential consequences spanning three overarching domains, right? Um, not only there's uh, the psychological aspect of it, but it's the fact that you could actually die or be disabled. So there's three things, there's three outcomes of the violence. Disability, death, or your mind being affected by it. And it says increased psychological morbidity, most notably as depression, suicidal, um, substance abuse, or or post-traumatic stress disorder is common. Um, and that's something that we got to address. And it says it here is backed by this article right here. All right. Um, and we're going to, we got like a couple more. Let's see. What is this? Hold up. I'm going too fast. All right. Coming up on 30, bro. We are coming up on 30. Actually, 20. 20. Let's go. <laughs> All right, hold up. So next. All right, cool. This is again gang membership. As compared to non-gang prisoners, street gang prisoners have higher levels of exposure to violence, symptoms of paranoia, PTSD, anxiety, and forced control of their behaviors in prison. Street gang prisoners were more like were not more likely to be segregated, but they were more likely to be um below what's that thing is blocking me below can below the what ethnic minority okay there you go below the ethnic minority um next slide violence against children it is clear that violence has a severe impact on the mental health of children exposure to violence is often traumatic and can evoke toxic responses to stress that causes immediate and long-term uh, Sociological and psychological damage. The consequence of violence include depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, borderline personality disorder. Again, this is from the Violence Against Children. Please go read the article. Um, this is just, again, to show you the impacts of violence on the mind. Uh, the last segment, um, environment. I guess you're going to win this bet. We are going to go over two hours. 
Uh, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> environment. As I, this is Coolio. It says, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I take a look at my life and realize there's nothing left. Again, describing what he was going through, his mind state. Um, I look around and do what I want. I look around and do I want to be another person that doesn't have things. Talking about poverty. The street did so much stuff to me that I can never live civilly. This is Benny the Butcher, Johnny P. Caddy. Um, I lost so many peers, shed so many tears. Uh, this is Tupac, shed so many tears, 1990s. The judge giving you years following your peers. This is Davies. Welcome to home DMX 2020. Again, paint the picture of what we see in our society on a daily basis, whether it's the judge giving you years for your peers making decisions that they thought was correct and there it wasn't correct because they wasn't given options and losing so many people because of the violence that occurred. All right. Uh, Remy, we could stop right here and cut the rest of the cut. cut you it want out. to? I mean, you look like you're busy. Did we finish? No, don't blame it on me. <laughs> I told you. We can finish the rest in 20 minutes. All right, let's do it. Because um, I don't know. I, I just don't want to. I mean, of course, the audience will follow it along. Yeah, for I just don't want to bombard them with too much information. You know what I mean? Nah, if, you, but if they're really interested, they're going to keep going. All right, let's do it. Let's do it then. We can cut that out after, right? Nah, we're going to leave it in. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, contaminated childhood, the chronic lead poisoning of low-income children and communities of color in the United States. This. this article right here, uh, Remy, is just to highlight um, the toxicity that's in our community. And lead, um, I remember the first time I even heard the word lead is when firefighters mm. came into my crib. Mm. And they were like, yo, yeah, walls got lead in it. You guys got to get it painted. And my mom had to get it painted. I didn't even know what lead was. I didn't even mm. know that the outcome of lead on mental health, but it does have a mental health um, impact, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is another article, disparity in risk factor severity, severity for early childhood blood lead among predominantly African-American ch children. So again, showing this, again, if you go to read this article, um, <laughs> it's gonna show you that um, lead poisoning and African-Americans are kind of like goes hand in hand, all right? Mm. So the quality of housing we saw the bronx burning down um so again another article the effects of lead poisoning on african-american low-income families in Tahiti in toledo ohio another um article proving that our community has a high rate of lead poisoning in it again because out where we live the buildings are old mm -hmm. the the educate the buildings that we're getting educated are all old um they're not checked for lead. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure if we do a, a if, if professionals come out community and do a study, they're gonna see a lot of things that affect us on a daily basis. My brother was actually um, affected by that personally. My older brother. It was a lawsuit my mom had against the the super at the time because of yeah she cons he actually consumed it and he he felt oh, ill. Really? Yeah, so he felt ill and uh, it was a lawsuit. I think oh, she won that case. Yeah, that's good. Study so finds link between childhood lead and exposure and mental illness. Exposure to a to lead at a young age may lead to mental illness. This this study, which follows 576 people in New Zealand for more than 30 years, started from age three, found an association between exposure to lead and mental health illness and paranoia, depression, mania, and schizophrenia. All right, mm. children can be exposed to lead through paint and dust in old homes. All right, uh, again, this article again shows how lead is, um, that lead exposes us to mental health disorders, especially the, the, the depressive disorders, depressive disorders. Um, go ahead and check this article out. And you can pause the video and check the article out. Um, it, it leads to a bunch of health issues mentally. Again, mental health, rats and roaches. A lot of rats and roaches are in poverty stricken areas. They're not really in suburban areas. That also affects your mental health. Um, majority of both black and white say police, black people are treated less fairly than whites in dealing with the police and by the criminal justice system as a whole. Police on every block 
for the amount of violence in the inner cities. Again, we have this conundrum of there's a lot of police in our neighborhoods, but that's because there's a lot of violence in our neighborhoods and that we we want that violence to stop. But the violence in our neighborhoods is due to the racism and the systematic oppression that we've been going through, um, which creates the police violence. And I remember there was a time where there's a police, there was a police car parked in front of my building and there was a police car in every single block when I walked. That's crazy. You know what I mean? So that's how much violence it was, where there was a police car had to be stationed on certain blocks. Um, and then because of that, the people that are in our communities, they come in with their own prejudice and their own beliefs, and then they're putting it in their own by pulling people out the car, stopping you for no reason, whether it be implicitly um, implicit bias, where they see you, they think that you have a weapon, so they pull you over. I've gotten stopped many times, plenty of times, uh, with friends, by myself, pulled out of vehicles, um, arrested, you know what I mean? All that stuff is it's there. Um, and again, it's all about perspective because me moving out here, you would, me moving in Mass, Massachusetts, you would think the police is all friendly and stuff because you've been in, because you don't, they don't really bother you um, when you get to um, other areas. But when you're in the inner cities, it's like they're right on you. But I can see why people in other areas could say, well, the police are good people because they don't really bother you when you're you got money. They don't need to bother you because they know that you're not going to do nothing crazy. They're not going to do nothing crazy, right? That that's their thought. But in our community, it's just because of other people doing crime. We're all put in that situation. Um, suicide resource. You want me to read it? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, suicide prevention resource center. Uh, mental health problems can affect. A student's energy level, concentration, dependability, mental ability, and optimism hindering performance. Research suggests that depression is associated with lower grade point averages and that co and that co-occurring depression and anxiety increase this association. It's crazy. So we are in these <laughs> communities and then we develop the, we develop issues from these communities, which then impact our education. And it's just like a negative cycle like over and over again it's just crazy like when you actually sit down and like look at the information and read it that's why this, this presentation is powerful because it gives it a visual for the things that we're, we've been actually talking about um peers family members uh faculty and staff may be personally affected out of concern for these students depression and anxiety can have harmful effects on relationship and work productivity Suicide and suicidal thoughts can affect the larger campus community. Roommates, peers, faculty, and staff also experience profound grief over student suicides and suicidal behavior. Absolutely. And these are things that me and you um, go through every single day because we're, we're, we're educators. And I'm pretty sure all the educators um, are are concerned about students of people, uh, 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 from the inner cities because of the things that they see. And it is concerning, not only for them, but it's also for, for me. And that's why we're doing it, because um, we just see it in the, the kids. Um, and the, these kids are going to end up being adults. And they're going to probably, if we don't, if there's not a change of behavior, probably going to make the same decisions as the adults. Because um, it's, again, behavior is learned. That's just what it is, just learned. Learn behavior is learned. You learn the behaviors that you do. Kids don't want to come out the womb shooting at anybody. Or, I mean, they don't come out the womb doing any negative things. They come out the womb pure, and we put what we put the the traits, the principles, um, what's right and wrong in them. And um, they're not getting that from the community. Then they're gonna just reenact what they see in the community, right? Um, there's a, you guys could look that up, but there's um, one of the educational founders, I think his name is Albert Bandora, and he basically said those those are the modes of learning, especially found in education. Children learn through observation, observing. Um, so definitely look up, I would say, you're like into education and learning and things like that. 
Albert Bandura is definitely one of the, like one of the founders who spoke about um, the way children learn and the way that they develop and things like that. So I think that was something to just put out there. All right, absolutely. Despite these efforts, this is addressing mental health in the Black community. True social justice among the Black community will remain incomplete until mental health disparities among all groups are addressed. Mental health is an essential part of overall physical health and satisfaction. The Black community suffers from an increased rate of mental health concerns, including anxiety and depression. The increased incidence of psychological difficulties in the Black community the increased incidence of psychological difficulties in the Black community is related to the lack of access to an appropriate and cultural response of mental health, prejudice, and racism inherent in the daily environment of Black individuals and historically trauma enacted on the Black community by the mental health field. Parenting with mental health. The effects of a parent mental health on children is varied and unpredictable. Although parental Mental illness poses biological and psychological and environmental risks for children. Not all children will be negatively affected or affected in the same way. The fact that a parent has mental illness alone is not sufficient to cause problems for the child and the family. Rather, it is how the mental health condition affects the parent behavior as well as the family relationship that may have caused to risk to cause risk to a child. The age the age onset, severity, and duration of the parent's mental illness, the degrees of stress in the families resulting from the illness, and many importantly, the extent to which parent symptoms interfere with the positive parenting, such as their ability to show interest in their children, will determine the level of risk to a child. The children's age and stage of development is also important. Again, uh, this is more spoken about, well, yeah, the parents have mental health Ill Ill illness, it doesn't always affect the child, but in instances, there are possibilities where it can affect the child. And um, being aware of that as a parent and showing time and effort and energy and interest in your children is very important. All right. Um, risk factors, children whose parents have a mental illness are at risk of developing social, emotional, or behavior problems in inconsistent, and unpredictable family environments often found in families in which a parent has mental illness contributed to a child's risk. Other factors that place all children at risk, but particularly increase the vulnerability of children whose parents have a mental illness include poverty, occupational marital difficulties, poor parent-child communication, parent co-occurring substance abuse disorder, open, aggressive, or hostile or hostile behavior by a parent and single parent families. All of this um, could contribute to mental health illness on the children, because again, time and energy needs to be put in a child. Like this, it's an investment. A child is an investment that will impede on your life. And it's not a, an impede is seen as a negative word, but it's something that you have to put in a lot of time in to invest in. Right, mental health of children and parents, a strong connection. The mental health of parent and children is connected in multiple ways. Parents who have their own mental health challenges, such as coping with symptoms of depression or anxiety, fear or worry, may have more difficulty providing care for their child compared to parents who describe their mental health as good. Caring for children can create challenges for parents, particularly if they lack resources and support, which can have a negative effect on a parent's mental health. Parents and children may also experience shared risks such as inherited vulnerabilities, living in unsafe environments, and facing discrimination and deprivation. Anything you want to add to that, Remy? Nah. Yeah, this is kind of self-explanatory, right? Yeah. Um, the mental health of parents and children are connected in multiple ways, right? Um, the other articles hinted to that. This is from the CDC. This is kind of like really confirming that it does have an effect. Again, a three source thing that we wanna have three sources so that we could prove our point. Um, and here it is, right? Make sure that again, parenting is so important, especially your kids and students that are going to school and trying to get a higher education. Cause we know that higher education equals to better economic status. And if you can't get that education because of your health, then you can't get um, that, the needs that you need. 
Um, all right. Um, you want to pause it right here, Remy? Pause it for what? You want me to? Because you're busy. You like you're busy, man. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Let me continue. I, I read this one. Yeah, we'll cut this out. Go ahead. I read this one. Yeah. Now we are cutting that out. Raw, 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 uncut. How your mental health <laughs> problems might affect your parenting. All parents face challenges, uh, mm -hmm. but if you have mental health problems, you may face additional difficulties. Mental health problems can vary in terms of how severe they are and how they affect you. You may need regular extra support, or you may be fine for, or you may be fine for long stretches and have periods where you need more help. Or other stressful life experiences uh, may make things more challenging for you. For example, money problems or relationship breakdowns can negatively affect your mental health. When you are unwell, you may find it difficult to deal with the daily challenges of parenting. For example, if you have low energy because of depression or feel very worried because of anxiety, manage your mood or emotions around your children, care for your children either physically or emotionally, manage your children's behavior or set boundaries for them. You may also experience stigma or discrimination from other people making assumptions or judgments about mental health. Uh, you might need to, to ask your children for help, for example, with getting younger siblings ready for school or doing housework. Uh, this can make you feel guilty and and may affect the amount of free time they have. It's crazy. This lie, I experienced all this in education, bro. I'm not going to lie. I yeah. experienced all this talking to parents who uh, was honest and let you know that they're struggling with something. You can see the interactions with the, with the students. You can see how... It impacts the students, but they can't even explain it. You just know that they're affected by it. And mm -hmm. it shows up in their, they're falling asleep in class, you know, the work. Sometimes you have a student, you know they could do it, but because the parent is suffering from something, then it rubs off on the kid. And you, you know, you're working with the, that student, you like, you know, I know you know this, like, what's going on with you? And then when you get deeper and deeper behind the, the situation in our communities, you see the underlying issues. And it's just crazy, like, it affects us on, various different aspects and it's just it's prevalent in our communities and like you mentioned earlier with some of the statistics you pulled out doesn't even seem like it's becoming stagnant it just seems like an increase like absolutely year after year it's crazy you see the same thing over and over again mm -hmm. i had a kid come up to me and and, and was affected by his schoolwork because um he his mom was going through alcohol issues um, and he told me that he was like, "Yo, my mom's going through. She keep drinking," and I'm like, "And I had to tell him like, yo, that's how she's coping with it. You know what I mean? Mm. The best way you can help her is just by having a conversation with her about how it affects you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's important for you to do that. And as a child, you might not understand what she's she's going through because you don't know how to how to comprehend all of this because you're dealing with adult stuff that." um at an early age you know what i mean because every adult drinks to relieve stress when you're mm -hmm. drinking excessively and it's hurting you in your relationship with your kid that's a, a an avenue for you to be like yo what what am i doing right you know what i mean because we we as parents you got to realize that the decisions you make all the decisions you make whether what you allow your kids to watch what you allow your kids to listen to what you allow your kids to be around affects your kid mm -hmm. We as teachers see it, and that's why we're doing this PowerPoint. Um, so conclusion. Oh, favorite word. <laughs> you know what I mean? Conclusion is over. It's been long. It's been long. And to make this PowerPoint <clears throat> took a lot. Because so you had to read all that. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you see my voice. <clears throat> I'm a little under the weather. So we're gonna cut that out anyway. But <laughs> Racism, poverty, fatherhood, violence, environment, and not including other traumas equal mental health issues. That is a fact. And mm. all most black people deal with racism. Me and you, Remy, we did with poverty. Um, we dealt with fatherhood, absence of fatherhood. We dealt mm -hmm. with violence. We dealt with we have dealt with six things. Mm -hmm. Cause there's things in here that we didn't even include that we have dealt with you know what mm -hmm. i mean as a person um as being a black man in america mm. and all six of these things as you can see is the most is the reason why we're the most traumatic traumatized group in america 
right? Yes. You want to read the slide? Uh, what impact does the environment have on us? Only you would put a conclusion and continue with the slide. <laughs> <laughs> you know that already. What impact does this environment have on us? Since the earliest times, humans have needed to be sensitive to their surroundings to survive, which means that we have an innate awareness of our environment and seek environments with certain qualities. For uh, First of all, humans have a strong need for safety and security and look for those attributes in their environment. We also look for physical comfort, such as environment with the right temperature. In addition, we seek environment uh, environments that that um, is psychologically comfortable. For example, environments that are familiar but offer the right amount of stimulus. Uh, the environment uh, can facilitate or discourage interactions among people and the subsequent benefits of social support. For example, an inviting space with comfortable chairs and privacy can encourage a family to stay and visit with a patient. The environment can influence people's behavior and, and motivation to act. For example, a dingy corridor filled with extra hospital equipment will invite staff to leave another item in the hall, whereas a clean corridor and adequate storage will encourage staff to take the time to put an item away. That's a, that's a fact. The environment can influence mood. For example, the results of several searches studies reveal the room uh, reveals that rooms with bright light, both natural and artificial, can improve health outcomes such as depression. Um, Hang on, let's block off about word. it. You just put sleep, and you know it could affect it affects depression and sleep. I think depression that, um, and sleep. The logo is about this is from the Minnesota. This is uh, Minnesota University right here. Nice. Um, nice. That's the Minnesota logo blocking the word. But you can go look at the website, read the article again. It just shows you that we need to be in adequate environments. And again, adequate environments is not going to be normal for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, that's just a fact. That's just a human fact. Throughout history, we just haven't been in adequate environments. But however, not everybody hasn't been in adequate environments, but however, we could be in those environments, but still hold ourselves to a certain level of um, expectations that could help and improve our mental health and improve our outcomes. And um, trauma can be repeated on, by, on behavior, emotional and psychological and neuro, neuroendological levels. Repetition mm -hmm. on these different levels cause a large variety of individuals and social sufferings. Anger directed against the self or others is always a central problem in the lives of people who have been violated. And this is itself a repetitive reenactment of real events from the past. People need a safe base for normal social biological development. Trauma traumatization occurs when both internal and external resources are inadequate to cope with the external threat. Again, in our communities, we don't have the resources to deal with all our trauma. Mm -hmm. Uncontrolled disruption and distortion of attachment bonds proceeds to the development of post-traumatic stress syndrome. People seek increasing attachments in the face of external danger. That's why people, kids join gangs. Adults, as well as children, may develop strong emotional ties with people who intermittently harass, beat, and threaten them. The persistence of these attachment bonds leads to confusion of pain and love. Now, um, these are just advices that we want people to use to get through their mental health. We want people to talk with everyone you know, talk to your family, talk to your coworkers. I had to talk to Remy before we did this podcast. Mm -hmm. We had to I had to talk to you know people around me before I did it, and um, a lot of people inspired me to to, to, to do this work. Um, my mentor that just told me, "Yo, do it, go do that." Shit. You know what I mean? I don't want to curse, but go do it, right? Mm -hmm. Open up about your experience, which we did um, throughout this. We opened up our experiences. This is getting these are medical advices. Um, open up about your about your experiences if you're struggling or struggling with mental illness, share your story, hearing another person going through the same thing, you can be can be a relief and it can be a the nudge a person needs to get help and investigate treatment. And this is exactly what we're doing right now. Um, we're opening up about our experience so you could get help so that you could live a fulfilling life. Um, encourage kind languages. I've seen this a lot that people haven't been really taking mental health seriously. Um, and 
and that's because of the, the the culture that we develop as a country as it well yeah you're going through this get over it with it um but you know we have to have time to cope with those things it doesn't mean that we should use it as a clutch it just should use that as a healing method so that we could be productive citizens in america right educate yourself about mental illness it's not common for people to misunderstand mental illness i had to do a lot of education about mental illness remy had to do it um we just didn't know about it right and i'm pretty sure a bunch of people didn't know about it either and that's fine that's why we do the research that's why you educate yourself mm. um coordinating mental health screening event leverage social media um encourage physical health that supports mental health help people understand that physical health can help can direct impact on mental health working out eating healthy can help your mind and help your body and your emotional state very important veggies and fruits um working out every day or if not working out every day at least take 30 minutes of your time to do a workout mm -hmm. very important um also be reflective of this survival brain versus learning brain um i learned this from a pd um at my job um shout out to ashley fogarty who brought this up and the crazy thing is when she brought this up uh, another teacher named jamal thomas he was like shout out to him he was like yo when he was learning about this he was like yo this reminds me of me and um and i'm thinking they're like yo you right this reminds me of me too and it's just basically children survival brain versus learning brain children operating in their learning brain feels calm connected curious confident and ready to learn when we are primarily in our survival brain due to an extreme amount of stress or trauma, our ability to access our executive function capacity is diminished. It's not saying it's not there, but it's diminished. So in inner cities, we need something more to help um, compensate for that diminished executive function capacities because there are we are going through trauma, extreme trauma, extreme amount of trauma. Right. And if certain executive functions, uh, function capa uh, capacities are diminished, could connect with you making less intelligent decisions. Definitely high, low percentage decisions, like going robbing a store or going right. to somebody because you want to get um, you want to get props from your gang, but right. you don't understand that that's you shooting or you stabbing somebody, you robbing somebody could equal eighty. 25 plus years of jail. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I saw a kid get like 90, 80 plus years for doing dumb stuff. You know what I mean? So these are things that, um, number one, we need to name those actions are dumb. We need to start pushing our kids to getting more educated and coping with this mental health um, issue that is going on in our community that we're like throwing under the rug. Mental health affects your decision in life. The effects of mental health disorder can alter decision-making processes and compound the symptoms. All of us are wired to seek reward and avoid losses. And that, remain, that remains true in people with mental health disorders. But in those people, the nature of risks and rewards and the way they activate the brain is screwed. It's screwed. That altered decision-making creates challenges for people trying to make good decisions for their own health whether it's overcoming depression, anxiety, or eating disorders. As teenagers, we stop making decisions based on constructive rules and start independently weighing the risks and rewards of different options, but with a greatly reduced re regard to risk. Basically saying here that teenagers, they don't make decisions based off the rules. They stop making independent decisions and start making group decisions because they want to impress other mm -hmm. people. And again, that that's very prevalent as teenagers where you're more you care more about what other people think than what you think of yourself. And you seek validation from other people by doing things that in our community at times are different detrimental. You know what I mean? I I didn't do a lot of things because I did not want to follow a lot of my friends in doing a lot of those things. All right. All right. A lot of them did join gangs. A lot of them used to throw rocks. At, you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna mention that, but you know they used to do that, and I'm I'm looking at that like, nah, I'm not doing that. You know what I mean? But you know what I mean? But again, you have to have that mindset in your mind. Where like, yo, I'm gonna make my own decisions for myself. I don't care what nobody else thinks. Mm. Right? 
Kids with depression are stuck in a similar predicament with brain changes that prevent healthy decisions. Again, growing up in poverty as a kid in our community, it was tough. Mm. It was tough. It's not, that's just real. Uh, I mean, we all grew up in poverty. Mm. So here's some things that you need to do to make sure that you're, um, again, I don't have all the solutions for mental health. I'm still um, figuring out other ways for me to cope with it. Um, and Remy's dealing with things for him to cope with it. And we're all dealing with things that we want to use to cope with our mental health situation. But these mm. are some advice that, you know, that I research on. And this is where I got from the, from the internet, right? Value yourself, treat yourself with kindness and respect, avoid self-criticism. Racism, racism, um, makes you fight yourself a, a lot. I think in our community, we kill ourselves in our mind before we even kill ourselves physically, before anything kills us physically. We kill ourselves in our mind. I think that's relevant to most things, yeah. right? You got to believe if your mind, like I said before, if your mind believes it, your body's going to follow. What's biological, psychological. You do not want to give up. You don't mm. give up. Nipsey said it great. Don't He never quit. Don't quit. It don't matter what you're going through. You could go through a whole bunch of this stuff. Don't quit. Surround yourself with good people. That's very important. Um, not everybody in your life is going to be positive energy. Um, so make sure you, you surround yourself with positive energy and people that are willing to, um, even though y'all could argue and y'all could disagree, but y'all still could be cool. That's very I important. think you skipped one, bro. Oh, take care of your body. Definitely. Mm. Take care of your body. We definitely talked touched on that before. Definitely take care of your body. Sleep, exercise, drink plenty of water, avoid smoking and vaping, eat nutritious meals. Um, if you are gonna do any of, of of smoking and drinking, please do it in moderation. Don't do it a lot excessively. Sometimes we do it excessively, and that could help. And that we think that is hurting or helping us, but it's actually hurting us. Mm -hmm. Give yourself, volunteer your time. You know what I mean? Help people, helping people. Um makes your mood feel better. Mm -hmm. I know that when I help people, um, it makes my mood feel better. And there's a scripture in the Bible that says, giving your, giving to the poor is like giving to God. Right. So, you know what I mean? You're giving to yourself when you're giving to the poor. Learn how to deal with stress. A lot mm. of people don't know how to deal with stress. I don't right. know how to deal with stress, extreme, especially extreme stress. All right? Uh, quiet your mind. Your mind is going to talk a lot. I know growing up, my mind talked a lot about um, not being good enough. Um, mm. And I had to fight that. You know what I mean? It really is me versus me. All right? Set realistic goals. Um, break up the monotone. Um, avoid alcohol and other drugs. And get help if you need it. The church, even though I'm not a big fan of church in our community, in black community, I do think that they do provide a a spiritual um, awakeness and they provide mental health and they provide faith. You know what I'm saying? Help. You know what I mean? Go music therapy. Music. What's some good music? Um, go see nature spots. All right. Last thing is the last three slides and um, we're going to close out. Your view of the future is shaped by the past. And this is about Art Markman, PhD. He said, they start by pointing out that your ability to envision the future is strongly influenced by your memories for the past. This is, you tend to use memories of the past experience to predict what your life will be like in the future. People were far more likely to set a predicted future event in a familiar location if they were thinking about the near future than if they were thinking about the distant future. We use our ability to envision the future to help us make plans. Our beliefs about what might happen in the future helps us to plan for obstacles that will confront us. A lot of good research on planning suggests that those people who prepare for failures are the ones best equipped to handle problems when they come up. Again, um, the thing that sticked out to me here was people were far more likely to set a predicted future event in a familiar location. Mm. Understand this. When, when we're born in in inner cities, we don't see the world, especially African Americans, because they don't have like a, a 
like me and you, we could always go to Haiti or we could always go to Canada. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Some Haitian people over there. But African Americans and some people from the Caribbean don't have that connection to their to their land. And that connection mm-hmm. to your to a land that's other than America could also give you like a location that um that could open your mind. Cause a lot of times when you're in the inner cities, your scope is small. Mm. And a lot of times we carry that small scope into adulthood, right? And mm. we have to expand our scope. And this is just basically saying that the more things, that's why we need more career days at school. We need more field trips at school. We need kids to travel more so that they can see areas that are not their areas. Because if they see area more of the areas that they're that, that are their areas that are violent, poverty, Nine times, a, most of the time, I wouldn't even say nine times a time. Most of the time, they're gonna keep thinking that they should just be in that area. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Again, not our fault, but it is our responsibility. It's the second to last slide, I think. Right, Remy? Yeah, it is. The last one. Yeah. Last two slides. Not our fault, but it is our responsibility. Every issue in the black community has its roots in racism and slavery. There's not. You can't argue. You can't. There's no argument against that. Mm. Right, a lot of our people in our community are judged based off the surface level, but they don't understand the roots of those causes. Right. Like Tupac said, right? Right. We grew up from the concrete, but nobody's explaining why we had to grow up from the concrete. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, we grew up from the concrete, and we have petals. Our petals are damaged. Our rose is a little crooked, but nobody's admiring that we grew up from an area that we just explained through all those slides, and we came up from that area. And Tupac mm. is saying, like, yo, did you not notice that do you not see the concrete? All right. Um, and I'm gonna touch on that a little bit later. I need we need parents to be parents, right? Um, it starts from the home. Um, we need to understand how mental health can harm us in making low percentage decisions, which can affect our child, our kids, and the adults who raise the kids or or our indirect role models, which is either the game members or the fathers or we don't like mental health could affect everybody in our community. And we just saw all the ways that it can. And ending the cycle starts with the home and constant pressure on our leaders and institution. It is definitely not a one person thing. It's a collective. Show the world that you matter. Right. The world is not going to tell you that you the world is going to say that, yo, you matter, but they're not going to show it through their actions. We have to ourselves prove to the world that we matter. All right. Um, and we can't show that we're matter because by using this as a clutch, a crutch, mm-hmm. we have to be able to um, seek the help and deal with it. Because again, mm-hmm. nobody's gonna care if you're poor or struggling in the hood. Like nobody cares. Right. Nobody cares if you didn't grow up with a father. Nobody cares if you didn't grow up with a dad. Nobody cares if you grew up in a violent community. Nobody cares about any of these things. Right. In the grand scheme of things, of course, people are going to have a a sympathy or empathy with this information. And hopefully that's what we want. Mm. But in reality, we can't think that people are going to give up their time to help us with our issues. We have to think for ourselves like, yo, we have to figure this out ourselves. It becomes our response. It's not our fault, but it is our responsibility because it is our children. We can't Mm. just be like, well... All of this is happening. Let's wait for the government to take care of us. No, right? Because the history doesn't support that—that that they will take care of us. Mm. Right? The government actually exacerbated this issue. If you really looked at history, mm. right? So it's up to us. It's our responsibility to fix these things. Right. Then it's our responsibility to even put even more pressure on our leaders. Mm. I don't know about right now because Biden's dealing with this Ukraine thing, but. Uh, we got to deal with that first, but then we need to deal with this. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And if you want to learn about Black African American history, go visit Crash Course Clint Smith. Um, I love this dude. He be speaking about um, Black American history. He sp- he speaks from 1619 all the way. Right now, he's on um, the uh, 1950s, 1960s, and I learned a lot from him. And that's me being a historian. Uh, very much admire him and his work, and I'm glad that he's doing it. Shout out to EYL for teaching business. Uh, we need more, again, professionals showing their face on um, podcasts so that we could change the narrative and mm. also improve our community. Anything you want to add to that before we close out? 
Uh, no, nah, overall, I think this was a powerful, powerful presentation, powerful PowerPoint. Uh, I commend you for taking the time. I commend you for taking the time too, man. <laughs> but you, so yeah, I got to give credit. Right, we ain't getting into that. We ain't getting into that, man. Yeah, <laughs> for just uh, doing the research behind this, you know. I know you was you was calling me when you was putting this together and you was talking about it, like, and I just saw, like, the work that you was putting in and the toll that it was taking on you. And I just, I got to commend you on that. And hopefully the people that see this could take from it what I took from it, what you took from it, making it, and could see that these things are real. It's not just coming from our personal experiences and encounters, but you know, they say men lie, women lie, numbers don't. So statistics is, is real, is there. And everything that you pulled out and that we discussed today, it shows like these things are prevalent in our communities. So hopefully the people that watch this could get through this. Uh, I know it's a little bit lengthy than we usually do, but it's because it was so much information you was pulling out. And there's no way to do something like this in like 10, 20, 30 minutes. So oh, no, I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's definitely want to stress. We got we gotta we gotta seek the, the help ourselves. Mm -hmm. No one's gonna present the help for ourselves. We gotta seek the help for ourselves, do our own research, do our own um treatments um if you could see a psychiatrist go see a psychiatrist if you're not comfortable seeing a psychiatrist um music nature healthy food exercising all that stuff helps i promise you it does um joey badass said it in the land of the free he said die from the sickness uh die from the sicknesses if we don't seek the health mm -hmm. so we don't want to die from those sicknesses mental health is a sickness um, and we want to make sure that we, we, we live this life to the best of our abilities, especially if we're coming from low income areas. Um, and we could defeat low income areas if we just defeat our meant our mind. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We could defeat poverty if we defeat our mind. Mm -hmm. we just can't quit. Don't quit. In the words of Nipsey Hussle, don't quit. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to end it off at. That's it. So that's it. You're closing out? Be closing.